lovely to see everyone this morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's talk, which is going to be all about global connections that we can evidence through the British Museum collections. So it's not the global connections of the British Museum per se, but we're going to take some objects that are housed at the British Museum and we're going to use them as a source of evidence to investigate what they tell us about global connections across time looking in particular at our, our two C's today, which are communities. So communities across the globe and also communities that have moved around the globe. And then also looking at commodities. So looking at particular objects and particular raw resources, raw materials that again demonstrate connections across human history and around the globe. So I'm going to begin by pulling up my PowerPoint. We will begin at the beginning. I will pick up my trusted laser pointer for the objects that have particular details on. And let me welcome you to Global Connections, Community and Commodity Links in the Museum Collection. And we're going to begin with one of the earliest objects from British history in the British Museum collection. This is an object known as the Grays in Lane Hand Axe, and it has been part of the museum collection since 1753. It was originally part of the collection of John, uh, Sir Hans Sloan, and therefore became an object in the founding collection of the British Museum. It's a pointed flint hand axe in the shape of a teardrop and it appears to have been used as there is ancient damage on both cutting edges. So damage to the napped edge down both sides of the hand axe and that damage is heavier on the right hand side. The object itself dates to around 350,000 BC, uh, what archaeologists know as the Paleolithic period, and it was found in modern Farringdon in London. And the object, at the point at which it was deposited, uh, was being used in a period when the landmass we know as the British Isles was part of mainland Europe, later a peninsula, before rising sea levels created the British Isles around 6000 BC. And just to say that our own species, Homo sapiens, who represent all the humans currently alive in the world, uh, they are a relative newcomer to Britain. The earliest evidence is a jaw fragment found in Kent's cave in Devon, estimated to be about 40,000 years old. And for thousands of years, the presence of modern humans in Britain was sporadic. Human beings coming and going, often in response to the incursion of ice during various ice ages, moving down from the north and at times covering almost the whole of modern Britain. And Britain itself has only been continuously settled by Homo sapiens since around 12,000 years ago. So what we're going to do today is we're going to move forward from our wonderful hand axe and we're going to be looking at a range of other objects, other commodities, which start to tell us about the movement of humans to Britain and also talk to us about networks which humans in Britain then start to set up, which then allow the movement of commodities, skills and people across time. So we're going to do a bit of a time leap because we're going to move from the Paleolithic and early settlement in the British Isles and we're going to move forward through prehistory to what is known as the Viking Age in Britain. And our object for this particular period is an object known as the Curedale Horde. And the Curedale Horde is actually a group of more than 
8,600 items, including silver coins, jewellery, hack silver and ingots. And hack silver refers to any item made from silver, which has been quite literally hacked or cut into smaller pieces. So there's a nice example up here in the top right hand corner where you can see that a bracelet, a silver bracelet has been cut. So only part of it is represented in the hall. The other parts may be further down, but it has now stopped being a wearable bracelet and is referred to by archaeologists as hat silver. Now, this hoard was discovered on the 15th of May, 1840, on the southern bank of the River Ribble in Cuerdale, near Preston, Lancashire. And interestingly, the coins in the hoard are from three different sources in a proportion of five to one, to one. And the largest proportion are from the Viking kingdoms in eastern England. And the other two portions of coins are firstly coins from King Alfred's kingdom of Wessex. So we start to see here a relationship between the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to the south and west of modern England and what at that time had become the Dane law, the area of northern and eastern England ruled by the Vikings. And this hoard shows example of coins circulating between those two areas of Britain, a mixture of Viking coins and also Anglo-Saxon coins, all silver. The final part of the coinage are coins from overseas. And these coins come from areas and sources which are Byzantine, Scandinavian, Islamic, Papal, Northern Italian and French, in particular from the province of Aquitaine in modern France. And it's believed that the hoard was buried around 903 to 910 soon after the Vikings had been expelled from Dublin in 902. And the location of the hoard is also important because the Ribble Valley was on an important Viking trade route between the Irish Sea and the Viking city of York. Now the Vikings had first invaded Britain in AD 793 and last invaded in 1066, when William the Conqueror became King William I. William's Viking great, great, great grandfather, Rollo, invaded Normandy in northern France in 911. The Viking homeland was modern Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And from here, they had traveled mainly by sea and river as far as North America to the west, Russia to the east, Lapland to the north, and then down to the Mediterranean world around Constanbul and Baghdad to the south. And experts have estimated that during the Viking Age, around 200,000 people left Scandinavia to settle in other lands, mainly Greenland, Iceland, Ireland, England, Scotland, France, where they became the aforementioned Normans, Russia and Sicily. They traded extensively with the Muslim world and also fought as mercenaries for the Byzantine empires of Constantinople, modern Istanbul. And when we look here at the English language, we can see that their legacy remains with us, not just in terms of objects, such as the one on screen, but also in terms of language. And the names of the days of the week come mainly from Norse gods. So Tuesday comes from Tur, Wednesday from Woden, 
also known as Odin, and Thursday from the god Thor. And we also have other words which you probably use on a daily basis, which are from Old Norse and which continue to circulate in the English language today. Those words, for example, being egg, bag, sister, fog, muck, lump and scrawny. So a lovely indication of how we can start with a physical presence, a set of objects which talk to us about the connections running from Scandinavia across Upper Britain, across to the island of Ireland, and which then take us outwards to think about the new communities that were developing during this period as people settled in Britain, and then also legacies that continue to the modern day. In this case, linguistic legacies with words that we use in the English language that have this ancient Norse pedigree. My next object is another coin this is a small gold coin, and this gold coin carries the inscription Offer Rex. And this shows us that the coin was made for Offer, King of the Mercians. So we're in the Anglo Saxon period here. Offer reigned Mercia between 757 and 796. And the design itself is copied from a coin of Offa's contemporary, the Baghdad-based Aleph Al-Mansur. And you'll remember we mentioned when we were talking about the Kyrdale Horde about the presence of coins from Baghdad and coins with Islamic inscriptions. And we see this again with Offa's coin. So at an earlier period, we have those developing trade and economic relationships between these two different parts of the Anglo-Saxon early medieval world. Now, the close copying that we can see on Offa's coin indicates for us not only the Baghdad-based ruler, but also the date of the coin from which this design was copied. And we know that the original coin was issued in AD 773. However, it's clear that the person making the coin, the person who cut the die that was used to strike the inscription into the blank gold plates, couldn't read Arabic. As there are minor errors introduced into the Arabic inscription, which is upside down in relation to offer's name and title. The inscription includes the phrase, there is no God but Allah alone, part of the Islamic declaration of faith. And it seems most likely that this coin was designed for use in trade. Islamic gold coins were the most important coinage in the Mediterranean at this time. And Offa's coin looked enough like the original that it would have been readily accepted in southern Europe, whilst his own name was clearly visible. So the idea here is not to create what we may call nowadays a counterfeit or a forgery coin. It's very clearly marked with its place of origin. It's very clearly marked with Offa's own name and we have the Latin letters in combination with the Arabic script. Also, at this point, coins were made from pure metals rather than alloys, so the value of the coin is in the weight of the gold bullion represented by the coin, and to ensure that whoever is trading with this coin knows that they have a complete coin, you'll notice that there are small little dots around the edge of the coin and these run in a complete circle all the way around on both sides and this is to ensure that you can tell if someone has clipped or cut off a little bit of the gold coin 
to steal some of the gold bullion because it is the total weight of the coin that gives it its value as a trading object. So what Offer is doing is not only is he using gold uh, as a value for high commodity training, but he's also using a design and a form of gold coin that would be recognized throughout the Mediterranean world. And he's almost using it as a standard to facilitate trade between the Anglo-Saxon merchants as they trade across Europe into the Mediterranean basin and then further across into the Middle East. And the idea of ensuring that your name, your portrait is on your coins as a way of demonstrating your control of an area is also represented on the coin that we see here now on the left hand side of the screen, which is a coin of King Canute. And with this coin, what we're looking at is not so much the creation of an economic network and an exchange of commodities, but we're looking at the creation of a political network and an expansion of political control from one area of Northern Europe to another. Here is King Canute himself. He is shown in the center of his coin, wearing his crown helmet, holding his royal scepter and swathed in a cloak with a decorated border and a large shoulder brooch holding the clothing in place. And then around the edge, we have his name. You can see Canute on the right hand side. And then as with offer, he ensures that we know his title as king, the word Rex on the other side of the front of the coin. Now Canute struck this coin as the King of England, and he was King of England from 1016. But Canute was also the King of Denmark from two years later, from 1018, and the King of Norway from 1028 until his death in 1035. And the three kingdoms united under Canute's rule were referred to as the North Sea Empire. So what we're looking at here is the creation by Canute of a small scale political empire in Northern Europe. He began his life as the son of the Danish king Sven Forkbeard. And in 1015, uh, obviously with political and regal ambition in his heart, Canute set sail for England with a Scandinavian army of about 10,000 aboard 200 longships. This invasion force was engaged in warfare with the English for the next 14 years, mainly against Edmund Ironside, who was the eldest son of King Ethelred. Canute was victorious, Edmund died, and in July 1017, Canute married Queen Emma, the widow of Ethelred and daughter of Richard I, Duke of Normandy. And with a position as King of England, Canute then adds into his empire the kingship of Denmark when his own father dies, then becomes King of Norway and indeed takes control of some parts of Sweden. His wife following his victory was this lady who we see on the right hand side of the screen. And Emma of Normandy is a very powerful and interesting early medieval queen. But she also enables us at this point in our story to tie in Canute's connections further south into Normandy in modern France. Because Emma of Normandy was twice Queen of England, 
by her successive marriages to King Ethelred and then King Canute. And to help promote the interest of her sons, her son by Canute, Hathen Canute, and her son Edward by Ethelred, she commissioned a flattering biography of Canute and herself, an early example of a secular biography. And what we're looking at here is an image of Emma from an illuminated manuscript, a page from this secular biography currently held by the British Library. And this copy of the manuscript was made in Normandy around 1041, probably at St. Omar for Emma herself. And it's the frontispiece and it shows Queen Emma receiving the book from its author, the monk, whose name has unfortunately been lost. And to the side, her two sons, I, her two husbands, look on. And a further note of connection was that Emma was herself, with her Normandy background, the great aunt of William I. So with the portrait of Canute and Emma before us, and with Emma's two sons, by Canute and by the previous Anglo-Saxon King Ethelred, we can start to see the political and royal and diplomatic connections that are circulating around Northern and Mid-Europe at this time. And also we can see how Emma, with her creation of this biography, is actually attempting to manipulate this situation to actually build up her husband Canute's right to the throne by recording his achievements as king and thereby promoting the cause of her own son by Canute to be the next king of England. Now, until 2008, it was believed that this was the only manuscript of this particular circular biography surviving. Then, in 2008, a new manuscript, the Courtney Compendium, was found in the papers of the Earl of Devon at Devon Record Office. This version, the only other known surviving version, is believed to have been compiled two years after the British Library one, and it adds detail to the context to the content and also the political context at the time, because the second version, which has now been acquired by the Royal Library of Denmark, shows the rise and succession of Emma's other son, Edward the Confessor. So again, it's an attempt through this secular biography, through what we would call the second edition, to again promote the rule of Emma's son, who had first been Athen Knut, and then on his death, her second son, Athelred, Edward the Confessor. He has only a fleeting mention in the British Library version, but by the time of the second edition, as it becomes obvious that he is now going to be the next King of England, he is written about in a fuller and very positive light. So we can see that at this time in early medieval Britain, we are looking at connections and we're looking at trade connections. So we can look at commodities which are being exchanged between Europe and across the Mediterranean to the Middle East. And we can also start to look at how these trade connections and how invasions and land grabs then start to be followed by the development of new communities, groups of people moving between different areas, bringing with them their cultures and their lifestyles, but also then becoming part of the new culture that they become part of, and then leaving a legacy in that, which we saw with the Viking words, the echoes of which we can often still see nowadays. 
Next object we're going to look at is a print. It's a print dating to 1640. It's a woodcut print and it is entitled The Prize of London. And it was made and published by a printer, Richard Newton, who operated from the King's Head in St. Martin Le Grand near Aldersgate in London. And it shows us street vendors, people who would have been out on the streets of London selling their wares. They're arranged in two rows, one under the other. Each vendor stands under an arch with columns separating them. And underneath each vendor is a small text, usually in verse form, giving an insight into what they are selling. And we are particularly interested in two of the vendors. We're going to be looking in particular at the lady in the top row, second from the left, and also the final lady in the bottom row. So let's start with our top lady. And you'll notice that she is carrying on her arm a basket full of oranges. And these oranges are mentioned in the text below. And what she is selling in 1640 London are Seville oranges, also known as bitter or sour oranges. The fruit of the Asian citrus tree spread by humans to many parts of the world, including Spain in the 900s ADs. Now, the Seville orange is used for making British orange marmalade, being higher in pectin than the sweet orange and therefore giving the marmalade a better set. The fruit itself is rarely consumed locally in Spain. And instead, once a year, oranges are harvested in Seville and shipped to Britain to be used in marmalade reflecting the historic Atlantic trading relationship which Britain had with Portugal and Spain. And one of the oldest recorded recipes for orange marmalade made using these oranges shipped in from Spain is found in a 1677 English recipe book by Eliza Chumney. And Keller's marmalade, founded in Dundee in 1797, is thought to be the first commercial brand of marmalade in Britain. So we see here that trading now going further south in Europe, moving away from our previous connections with Northern Europe, we're looking at how also trading down along the Atlantic coast is bringing commodities up into Britain from Spain. In this case, a type of orange which had itself already moved by human hand from its native area in Asia to be grown across in the warm climates of southern Spain and then shipped up to Britain to be used as a harvest, the final fruit to be made into marmalade. Let's go to our lady in the bottom row here. And our lady in the bottom row again has a basket over her arm and in her arm she is carrying glassware. You can just see the shape of some of the goblets with their round tops and their fluted bodies. And then also in her basket she has some small more cylinder shaped pieces of glassware which nowadays we would refer to as a beaker. And underneath in the verse we see that she is selling Venetian glassware, a type of glass made in the Italian city of Venice. And this sort of glassware was traditionally elaborately decorated with gilding, enamel and engraving. And production of this sort of glassware had been centred on the Venetian island of Murano since the late 1200s. And it became Europe's major centre for luxury glass from the 1300s. Now, since glass factories often caught fire, 
having it situated on an offshore island removed one possible cause of a disastrous fire in the city of Venice. Now, originally, Venice was controlled by the Byzantine Empire, which was the later Roman Empire in the East. It later became an independent city state and a flourishing trade center and seaport. Connections with the Middle East helped Venetian glassmakers to gain skills, since glassmaking was more advanced in areas such as Syria and Egypt. And during the 1400s, Venetian glassmakers invented Cristello, an almost transparent glass considered the finest glass in the world. And in the British Museum collection, we have two pieces of glass, which are a lovely illustration of the different types of glass that our 1640 street vendor uh, may well have been selling. And we saw examples of both of these in her basket. So to the left, we have a beaker. And this beaker dates from about 1850, so late Tudor. And it's made from a rosy gray glass it slightly goes outward at the rim and has a narrow base ring at the bottom and is decorated all the way around with a slightly uneven trail of glass beads, which are spiral at the bottom and then flatten out to create rows near the top. This little glass beaker has a height of nine and a half centimetres and was made in Antwerp. So an indication that the glass seller in London was selling wares not only from Venice but also from other glass production areas in Europe who were creating glass of not quite so high a quality as that available from Venice. On the other side of the screen, we do indeed have a piece of Venetian glassware. This dates also from the late 1500s and is a Venetian glass goblet. It has a funnel bowl with a bulb and bell foot. A bell foot because you can see it's hollow inside, like an upside down bell. And this is the area that the drinker would have then held to ensure that the contents of the goblet weren't heated by the warmth from a human hand. It's been decorated with diamond point engraving. So once the glass had been manufactured and had set and cooled, it would then be engraved in this case with floral scrolls tiny insects, and then a formal band of decoration, including little heart motifs and a wavy scroll around the top. And this particular goblet is much larger than the beaker. This has a height of 27 centimetres, but is much narrower in diameter and would have been available to those with a higher household income would have cost more than our beaker to the left and probably would have held higher quality drinking liquids as well. So higher quality wines than those that may have been drunk from the beaker. So glassware coming into London in the Tudor period not only gives us an indication of the different social hierarchies within Tudor London and the different levels of glassware that people were able to buy into, but also gives us an indication of where those commodities, the commodity of glass, is being traded from and the different networks that London has in terms of London merchants trading out towards nearby European countries such as Belgium and then trading further round into the Mediterranean and to the Italian peninsula. Our next object is one object, we can see both sides of it on the left hand side of the screen, accompanied by a portrait 
which will give us further information about our gold coin on the left. And this is a gold coin which was recovered from the Sulcum Cannon site shipwreck. It's a gold coin minted in Marrakesh in Morocco, Africa. It has a weight, solid gold, of 4.36 grams. And we know from the inscription that it was minted in AD 1600 by the then Sultan of Morocco. And it came into the British Museum in, the 90, in 1999. And you can see here the little number 31, which was written on one side of the coin, refers to the fact that it was the 31st such coin to be registered in the museum collection that day. Now the coin itself comes from the wreck of a ship, which is in the Urm estuary of Sulcum. And this ship went down around 1630 to 40. The vessel, indicated by a number of cannons and anchors on the seabed, is unknown. And the wreck site itself is a protected wreck managed by Historic England. When it was excavated, it yielded the largest ever find of Moroccan gold in Europe. Over 400 Moroccan gold coins, ingots and jewellery, as well as fragments of Delft pottery from the Netherlands. The latest coins so far indicate a date of around 1631. So this is one of the indicators that the archeologists use for trying to work out when the wreck may have occurred. Carrying coins of 1631 indicates that the wreck occurred after this date. There are also two non-Islamic coins, two copper coins, one of which was struck in the Netherlands in 1627. Now, much of the jewellery recovered is in pieces, so rather like the hack silver that we saw in the Cuerdale hoard, suggesting that it's being transported as bullion to be melted down, gold, of course, being an eminently recyclable material. And the ship itself may have traded between Britain and North Africa, because it's known that at this time there was a regular trade in gold from North Africa into Europe. And in 1585, the Barbary Company was established by Queen Elizabeth I through a patent granted to Robert Dudley, 1st Earl of Leicester, and his brother Ambrose Dudley, Third Earl of Warwick, along with 40 London merchants who benefited from exclusive trade via the Barbary Company with Morocco for a period of 12 years. So it was a monopoly, a monopoly trade granted by Queen Elizabeth to these London merchants to trade with Morocco. And Morocco at the time was ruled by Ahmed al Manson, who was the Sultan of Morocco, and he had excellent diplomatic relations with Queen Elizabeth. And over a hundred of the coins from the Sulcum wreck, including the one we have here on screen, were, stuck, were struck during his reign. And many of the other coins in the wreck were struck by future rulers who were members of his family. Now, in 1600, the Sultan of Morocco sent his secretary as ambassador of Morocco to the court of Queen Elizabeth I. And we have a portrait of this Moroccan ambassador, a painted portrait, which is currently owned by the University of Birmingham, which we see here on the right of the screen. And the ambassador's stance and clothing, as well as his prominent scimitar, his curved sword, indicate his cultural and military prestige. And publicly, the embassy was negotiating a trade agreement, which was picking up 
on the initial formation of the Barbary Company, which had been a monopoly for trade between England and Morocco through the merchants in London. But the real purpose of the visit was to form a military alliance against Catholic Spain. So a lovely example from the late Tudor period of how a trade delegation are then masking, obscuring a, a level of relationship which then switches to political, mili military and even religious in terms of a Protestant country and an Islamic country, then creating an alliance against a very powerful Catholic country which sits between these countries and which historically had been hostile to both the other partners. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take that idea of military, uh, sorry, of religious difference being a driver of communities and commodities as we look at our next set of objects and we look at a set of objects made by a set of very skilled craftspeople who moved from Europe to England, the Huguenots. And we're gonna take a quick 10 minute break before we move on to the Huguenots. And I'm going to leave on screen this particular object from the British Museum collection. It is a case, a case, external case and internal workings of a clock made by a Huguenot clockmaker in London. And what I'd like you to do is have a look at the outside of the case and you'll see that as well as the time dial, there are four other dials on the front of the case. The back of the case is beautifully decorated. This would have been where you open the back panel to see the workings. So normally hidden, unless you were opening the clock to get at the workings. And I wonder if anyone on the back can work out what the small image is that the engraver has placed at the center of the back panel, slightly obscured by the pendulum. It's, uh, I'll give you a clue, it's a biblical image, uh, slightly relevant to the story of the Huguenots. So I will leave this on screen and I will see you again in 10 minutes. Hello and welcome back. So let, let me, Catherine, let me read what people have said about this. So it's, it's a bit hard to tell, it might be simply a, a simple perspective, but, I, but I'll guess it's David and Goliath, said one person. Uh -huh. Someone else says uh, it's the parting of the Red Sea. Uh -huh. um, I think that's, uh, is, it, is, it, is it from the book of Exodus? Because I'm thinking it, it could be something to do with, with the, um, the Edict of Nantes, with the, when the Huguenots were ejected from France and they all came over to England in the early 1720s. Uh -huh. uh, what else is there? It depicts their persecution, says somebody else. Uh -huh. Yes, some, some lovely ideas then. And the parting of the Red Sea, uh, that really does seem to be suggested by these little landscapes with their little trees. They do indeed look as if there is a parting of the Red Sea, the Reed Sea, uh, with, with Moses. Uh, and that's an interesting link, actually, because certainly these people have a journey, leaving one land for another. Um, it also is, I think, closely related to the idea of their persecution and their survival, because we are indeed looking at David holding the head of Goliath. So the victory of the small over the large, because the Huguenots were a group of French Calvinist Protestants who found themselves um, in opposition and persecuted by the Catholic Church in France. And Catholic hostility <coughs> to the Huguenots led to the French Wars of Religions, which occurred intermittently between 1562 and 1598. Uh, there was then an Edict of Nantes, which was granted by the French King, <coughs> uh, which gave them limited um, autonomy 
within the French Catholic state. Uh, but over time, relationship again declined between the two faiths and Louis XIV issued the Edict of Fontainebleau in 1685, which effectively ended legal recognition of Protestantism in France. And at this point, the Huguenots had only two choices. With the end of the Protestant faith as a recognized religion in France, Huguenots could either convert to Catholicism or leave the country as refugees. And indeed, persecution of Protestants in France didn't end until the Edict of Versailles in 1787. So some of the Huguenots in France would have converted, others chose to leave the country. And one of these was a Huguenot, Claude Duchesnay, who left Paris to start a new life in London. And he is the clockmaker who made the clock we see here on screen, now held by the British Museum. And he was a brother of the Clockmakers Company in 1693. And he lived in Long Acre in the parish of St Anne's, Soho. And he lived until about 1730 and had at least one son, Anton, who became a member of the Goldsmiths Company. And what we have here on screen is a large bracket clock with a carrying handle made in Claude Duchesnay's clockmaking workshop. It has a large time dial on the front and four small dials around the edge. The top left is the dial used for regulating the clock to keep it running on time. The top right is the dial which enables you to have a striking clock. This clock would strike on the hour, the half and the quarter or to silence the striking. The bottom left is a clock that indicates months. And then on the bottom right, we have a dial which indicates the days of the week. So it's, it's a clock and a calendar all combined in one. And then the movement, which we see on the other side of the screen, which regulates the movement of not only the central dial, but the calendar dials on the front, uh, is then decorated on the back with this elaborate scrolling and floral design. And then at the centre, overlooked by an angel with winged trumpeters, we have this scene of David victoriously holding up his defeated foe, Goliath. And I think that does indeed link back to this story that the Huguenots were carrying with them as they ch chose to move from France to other Protestant countries in Europe of the idea of being a small faith up against the might of the Roman Catholic faith in France, which of course at this time is very closely tied to royal power and therefore has not only a religious but also a regal and a political status in France, which they were seen by their use and their display of a Protestant faith to be in opposition to, not only religious opposition but also political opposition and political opposition to the king himself as head of the Roman Catholic faith in France. Now, as well as clocks, Huguenots traveling to England brought with them skills in watchmaking and also enameling and jewel setting. And we have here on screen a small verge watch made by the Huguenot David Bouquet in London in 1650. Because as a major Protestant nation, England helped shelter Huguenots and the first Huguenots settled in Colchester in 1565. And overall around 50,000 Protestant Walloons and French Huguenots fled to Britain. 
and is estimated that by 1700, the Huguenot population in London was around 20,000. And one of the Huguenots arriving at this time was Elizabeth St. Michael, who married Samuel Pepys in 1655. On the 23rd of March, 1709, the Parliament passed an act which gave all Huguenots who had arrived in Britain since 1685, when the Edict of Fontainebleau banned the Protestant faith in France, full legal rights and protection as British citizens. By the 1600s, clockmakers and watchmakers who had fled from France were working just outside the control of the city of London, particularly in Blackfriars. And these Huguenot refugees brought with them their skills in engraving, enameling and stone setting. And we have examples of this on the watch here. This is one of the finest watches that came from David Bouquet's workshop. The case is a gold case enameled all over in black. And we can see here on the front, it is then decorated in colored enamel with a floral design. Inside the dial, it is enameled with a small painted landscape. And inside the lid of the dial, there is another black rural landscape painted on a blue background. And then the cover of the back of the watch is set with 92 foil set diamonds. Now, watches such as this are extremely rare and such lavish pieces were probably only affordable to the court elite. And the movement for the watch is made to fit the case, since once completed, alterations could not be made to such an intricately decorated enamel case. In the British Museum collections, we also have a portrait of one of these Huguenot refugees. This is a portrait of a man called Matthew Matte, who lived from 1718 to 1776. And he was a member of the Huguenot community in London. He's dressed in his frock coat over his waistcoat and he has a turban on his head. And this portrait was created as a result of his will in which he instructed his executor who was his wife, Mary, to employ an eminent engraver to engrave his portrait and to then print a hundred copies to be distributed to friends and family. Now, Matthew himself was born in Utrecht in the Netherlands. His father, having been a Protestant refugee from France who had settled in the Dutch Republic. The family then moved to London, where in 1750, Matthew began to publish a bi-monthly journal printed in The Hague, which gave an account in French of the main stories circulating in the British press. So a bit of a, a cribs sheet for mainland Europe of the key stories circulating in Britain. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in December 1751. And when the British Museum was established in 1753, he was nominated to work as an underlibrarian in the new institution. So not only is his portrait held by the British Museum, but he was at one point a member of staff at the British Museum. What we have opposite is another print held by the British Museum. And this print is entitled Noon. And it is from a set of four paintings by William Hogarth, painted in 1738, entitled Four Times of the Day. 
And the original painting on which this British Museum print is based is currently held as part of the Acaster collection at Grimsthorpe Castle in Lincolnshire. And what we see here is a scene taking place in Hog Lane, part of St Giles with the Church of St Giles in the field in the background. And what we have in the foreground divided by the gutter running down the centre of the lane are two communities in St Giles. On one side to the right we have an elegant crowd leaving the French Huguenot church. Opposite a group of rowdy Londoners outside a tavern where food is being thrown from the top floor a young man is embracing a young woman and a little boy cries because he has dropped and broken his pie dish with the pie inside it. On the other side, amongst the members of the Huguenot congregation, we can see that the older members of the congregation are wearing traditional dress, probably dress and ways of dressing that they brought with them from their life in mainland Europe, whilst the younger ones are wearing the latest London fashion. And the boy at the back, with his back turned to us, we can see that he has his hair netted and bagged up in what was known as the French style. Now, these four images by Hogarth uh, can be seen as a parody of middle-class life in London, but the moral judgments are not as harsh as they are in some of Hogarth's other works, and the lower classes do not escape ridicule, ridicule either. And art historians think that one of the main themes running through these is the theme of over-orderliness versus chaos. So what Hogarth has done is he has given us an image which balances what he sees as the very orderly culture of the incoming Huguenots emerging from their church on a Sunday morning, as opposed to the London cavern, tavern culture on the opposite side of the street. We're now going to move on to another mechanism which builds communities and circulates people around the world. We're going to look at sailors. And we know that sailors were recruited from Africa, the Caribbean and the Americas to serve in the British Royal Navy. Some were taken on as crewmen while the ship was operating overseas and others enlisted from amongst the black population resident in Britain. And we know that the Jamaican-born Francis Barber went to sea whilst living in London. He enlisted in 1759, served on HMS Stag, but was discharged at the insistence of his friend and employer, Samuel Johnson, in August 1760. Further information about the diversity of Royal Navy ships is given in their muster rolls, which record the place of birth and age at entry of a member of crew to the ship's crew. And unusually, the muster rolls for HMS Belfanor also record ethnicity and record that 10 black soldier, sailors were amongst the crew at the Battle of Trafalgar. So these two images from the British Museum give us an insight into both of those processes. We have here to the left a collection of sailors sitting below deck sketched by a serving lieutenant, John Sherringham, who is also an amateur cartoonist, and he has drawn this sketch around 1819 to 1825, showing six of his fellow sailors sitting around a table below deck 
discussing their recent naval adventures. And amongst these, we have a sailor who may have been recruited while the ship was sailing near Africa, the Caribbean or the Americas, or may have enlisted directly from Britain as a member of the BRAC population resident in Britain at that time. We look across to the right and we see here a print from 1805 showing the death of Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar as he is carried up from the quarter deck where he has been shot. And you can see that amongst him, the sailors continue with the business of war and amongst them, we have the face of one of the African heritage sailors who was serving on board the Victory during the Battle of Trafalgar. Having served in the Navy, some of these sailors then retired into life in London and took up a second career. And what we have here are two pictures from the British Museum collection of a person known as the Old Commodore of Tottenham Court Road. The image to the left is a print based on a picture drawn from life and printed by the printer William Day, who was operating in Lincoln's Inn Fields when this was printed. And it shows us a picture of the old Commodore who lived on Tottenham Court Road and he is depicted wearing his top coat, holding a top hat, resting his hand on a broom handle and with a wooden leg. And his appearance is almost identical in this 1835 sketch by William Scarfe of the same person taken on Tottenham Court Road. And images like this often capitalised on the local fame of well-known individuals. And this particular person was mentioned in 1832 in his role as sweeping a crossing on Tottenham Court Road. Now, the title Commodore is a high ranking officer in the Royal Navy. And perhaps this, this nickname indicates that he had a seafaring past to those who therefore dubbed him the old Commodore. He also has an injury to his lower right leg, which could have been sustained on board a ship. Now at this time, Tottenham Court Road was predominantly rural in nature. And there were cow sheds still standing on the road, which were destroyed in a fire in 1877. And a farmhouse from the 1600s wasn't demolished until 1917. So a road leading up from what was the flourishing and elite Bloomsbury towards the more rural areas of Hampstead. And the old Commodore would have worked as a sweeping cross, a crossing sweeper who made his living sweeping pedestrian crossings of horse muck and litter. And before motorised transport, over a hundred thousand horses moved along London streets daily. Now the journalist and advocate for social reform Henry Mayhew, in his 1851 book, described the advantages of such an occupation. First of all, he mentioned the smallest capital required in order, in order to commence the business, i.e. this ex-sailor, in terms of capital, needs to invest in a brush, a sturdy, robust bism brush, which he can then use to sweep the crossing many, many times a day to facilitate the crossing by pedestrians. Secondly, Mayhew says that this occupation offers an opportunity to solicit gratitudes without being considered 
a beggar. So what the old Commodore is able to do is he's able to engage in employment which offers a service for people crossing the road, which encourages the bestowing of tips and therefore guarantees an income stream without him directly begging. And then the third benefit arises from being constantly seen in the same place which Mayhew says would often excite the sympathy of neighbouring households who would sometimes give such a road sweeper a small weekly allowance or provide food from the household kitchen. And this idea of Britain's navy, both the Royal Navy and the Merchant Navy, being a mechanism which not only allowed a flow of commodities, but also a flow of people and the development of communities is picked up in our next set of images, which are three modern photographic portraits of members of the Yemeni British community in South Shields. And South Shields has been home to a Yemeni British community since the 1890s and similar communities were founded in Hull, Liverpool and Cardiff. The main reason for the Yemeni arrival was through employment as seamen on British merchant vessels. South Shields is a large coastal town in Tynan Weir and records show that several hundred Yemeni sailors were living there in the 1890s. Between 1910 and 1930, more people arrived and the community at one point reached 4,000. 12 members of the community are represented in photographs purchased by the British Museum from a set taken by the Egyptian photographer, Yosef Nabil, for an exhibition which he held at the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Arts in Newcastle in 2008. And the original Yemeni sailors came from the port city of Arden, which was under British control. And we have here a photograph in the British Museum collection of Arden in 1906. And these seamen needed places to stay when ships were in port. However, they struggled to find accommodation in South Shields and so set up their own boarding houses, which ran like modern day bed and breakfasts. On retirement, some settled in Britain, married and raised families, and the community in South Shields currently includes six gener sixth generation members of the community. One of these seamen, Ali Saeed, opened the first seamen's boarding house in 1894. And by 1920, there were eight boarding houses operating in the area. Other former sailors settled and opened cafes and shops. And the boarding house owners played an important role in the lives of the sailors, offering assistance in securing their next ship and also money and advice. And while I was researching this community, I found this rather lovely photograph from the South Shields Gazette, which shows one of the modern members of the Yemeni community, Mohammed Al Saidi, in his boarding house in 1994, in the kitchen, preparing food. And as soon as I saw his photograph, I realized that he was one of the gentlemen who have unfortunately come into the collection without their names marked against the photographs, represented in the set of 12 members of the community currently housed by the British Museum in photographic form. So there is his formal photograph commemorating the community. And there is the man himself at work in his boarding house in South Shields. We're going to continue with prints as objects which give us an insight into the movement of people 
in this case, the movement of an individual person representative of a larger religious movement in the 20th century. These two woodcuts are prints made by Bettina Adler when she was living in Wales between 1939 and 1947. Uh, the one to the left shows a single bare tree with its branches exposed to the winter sky. And the one on the right is a woman standing in the wind with her back to the viewer looking out over the Welsh landscape under a darkening sky. Both of them are hand-coloured woodcuts produced by Bettina. And both of them are part of a set of 22 woodcuts, which she made during this time, which were parceled together in a piece of paper inscribed in ink with the words, Light Friends, in the artist's handwriting. Now, the artist was born, Bettina Gross, in 1913 in a Jewish, to a Jewish family in Prague, and she began wood carving at an early age before studying with a master wood carver, and then in the 1930s studying sculpture in Prague and drawing in Paris. She arrived in Wales as a refugee in 1939 and worked at the Button Factory in Merthyr Tydfil throughout the war. Her father, Dr Emil Gross, had died in 1936 and her mother Bertha died in Auschwitz in 1944. In 1947, Bettina married the writer and historian H.G. Adler who was himself a Czech Holocaust survivor, and they settled in London. Here, Bettina began to work as a commercial artist, making fabric designs and lino cuts. And then in the 1960s, she resumed her practice as a sculptor. The collection of prints and drawings, two of which you see here on the screen, were presented to the British Museum in 2003, wrapped in their original wrapping, their outer paper envelope from the 1930s, and they were presented by her son, Jeremy Adler, in gratitude for the sanctuary afforded to his mother by Britain during the Second World War. And I'd like to finish our talk today with a modern object, an object made in 1980, a dish made in Farnham in Surrey from wet red earthenware which has been press molded and burnished and it's been incised on the front with a square crossword with a geometric border pattern and a tiny if you see just next to the square 23 on an enlargement to the left a tiny scorpion and the undersize of the dish is inscribed with the artist's name and the title of the piece which is guardian may 6th 1980 and the piece was made by the potter Zagidi el nigrim who was born in the sudan and studied calligraphy at khartoum art school he came to England in 1957 to study at the Central School of Arts and returned to Khartoum to teach before coming back to England in 1967, where he took up work as a teacher at the West Surrey School of Art and Design. And he's known for his use of traditional African techniques with hand-built pots in burnished red earthenware with incised decorations. And this tiny scorpion incised on the piece forms part of his signature, which you see across many of his other pieces. And what I particularly like about this piece and why I think it's a nice piece to end on is that it is a fusion. It is a combination of the potter's traditional Sudanese heritage drawing in the burnished ware, 
and the incised ornamentation often seen on Sudanese redware. A tradition which goes back to the prehistoric pottery of Sudan, dating to 2300 BC, but then in its decoration draws in a part of the potter's life in Britain, the decoration being a crossword from the Guardian newspaper. And the inspiration for this design perhaps goes from his observation of the popularity of crosswords in British culture, and perhaps references his own background in calligraphy, which gives him an interest in graphic and topographic forms purely for their aesthetic qualities. And when we look at the crossword, we can see how he's picked up the idea of the pattern of squares across a crossword, the use of numbers to indicate where the letters will then start to be filled in. And he has then picked up elements of Sudanese design to mark out what in a newspaper crossword would be the black squares indicating where no letters need to be filled in. And I also rather like the fact that some of these squares seem to be floating off, almost as if they're escaping the crossword. So there's sort of a lovely combination, a lovely movement, a lovely energy of Sudanese pottery traditions uh, combined with this sort of this formal, very ordered topography and layout and design of a British crossword. So I hope you've enjoyed our talk today and I hope that it's inspired you to have a look at some of the other objects that we have in the British Museum collection. We have a wonderful online database, British Museum Collection Online, where these objects are all drawn from. And do take a little look if you've got a particular heritage that is part of your background, uh, then search box to look up particular parts of the world. Uh, you can look at particular periods, you can search against dates, against places, against people. Um, also, we've touched on a number of communities during our talk today, some, some of them such as the Huguenots. So if you want to go away and do a bit more research on the, the history of those communities, a, a very complex set of interactions for the Huguenots dating from the Reformation through to the French Revolution, when in effect all religious groups in France were equal citizens uh, with the end of the monarchy and the declaration of the secular French Republic. Uh, we now have a bit of time before the end of our talk for any questions people might have or any comments that you would like to share with the group. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, a couple of comments saying, uh, great lecture, thank you, and wonderful, most informative, thank you very much. Um, yeah. If there's any questions for Catherine, please ask them now or put them into the Q&A section. I'm sure she'll be, she's happy to answer anything you've got. Mm. Do we know how, um, how many Huguenots came into Britain uh, in, this, in, the, in the early 18th century? Is that, are there numbers? Um, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, the, the figures are in the hundreds of thousands, um, settling mainly in Britain around London, though we do know that some of them journeyed across to America as well, where, of course, uh, with the development of the British colonies on the east coast of America, there was a strong Protestant culture, uh, which would have fitted with the Huguenots Calvinist Protestant background. Um, those who stayed in France would either have converted or gone into hiding, though we also know that some of them moved to other Protestant countries in Europe, so a lot of the Huguenots moved to the Netherlands, uh, but movement of Huguenots really continued all the way through the 600s and the 700s as persecution increased um, under the various Catholic French kings. But yes, we're looking at a population of hundreds of thousands. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, here's a question. Uh, can we meet you? Meet uh, so can we meet you in a visit to the museum? Is someone's asking? Ah, oh, now this is a very good question because one of the reasons that um, Camden was so keen to set up this set of history workshops is that <clears throat> for the lockdown. Uh, of course, there was a huge public program running through the British Museum in Camden, uh, including gallery talks. Uh, which cover many aspects of the collection and I was one of the people who gave the gallery talk so yes once public programming resumes at the British Museum then <coughs> will indeed be out in those galleries uh, talking about our objects, um, objects from around the world and across time and also as I hope you saw with our talk today not just thinking about historical narratives although as a historian I love those but also thinking about sort of slightly theoretical ways that you can get into a subject and how you can start to look at, say, human migration in terms of push and pull factors that may be religious, that may be economic, that may be to do with lifestyles, that may be to do with the need for new lands for farming. Um, so, yes, all these ways that encourage people to look at our objects as sources of evidence for the past that go beyond their form and function um, is something that I do in the British Museum galleries and it's part of the public program on the British Museum website. You may also be interested in other adult lectures that the British Museum put on, particularly if you're a remote learner who's not actually in Camden. Uh, and if you go on to the events and exhibitions pages on our website, you'll see that there's a number of free online lectures directly from the British Museum, often linked to our exhibitions. So, yes, talking about what we've got is something we are keen to do in the learning department. Cool. Um, in the 1835 Totten Court Road sketch, what did it say in handwriting on the angle near his head? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, the sketch was made by um, George Scarf and it was noted with the, the title, the old Commodore of Tottenham Court Road. So we know who he was and where the sketch was done. And I think it's also dated, he usually dates all of his sketches. So he would have written a date onto it as well. We've got a number of his sketches in the British Museum. Um, that particular one is on Collections Online. So after the talk, if you go into Collections Online and you either search through George Scarf or you can just put in Tottenham Court Road or the old Commodore, uh, then it will bring up all of his sketches. And he did a lot of sketches of street vendors uh, in Victorian London, of which the old Commodore was only once. And it's a nice balance to the Tudor street vendors that we saw in the talk as well, because uh, he picks up all the people who are continuing to buy and sell on the London streets from Tudor times through into Victorian times and indeed into modern times uh, with the newspapers and the little tourist kiosks that sit on the London streets. There's quite a few of those at the bottom of Tottenham Court Road that I walk past every time I come to the museum. So collections online I'm going to recommend because they always have a written description of all the objects, which usually describes what any of the inscriptions are. And if they're in another language, they try to give a translation of them as well. But his sketches, George Scarf's sketches, are particularly lovely, obviously made in the moment while he was standing in the street watching this aspect of life. Um <clears throat> Did you say that the Huguenots mainly resided in Colchester? Did this influence much of the Flemish architecture there? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, Colchester is where we know that there was one of the earliest settlements of Huguenots. Huguenots mostly lived in southern and western France, so they were on the Atlantic seaboard. So in terms of migration, their migration was then across the Channel and the North Sea, uh, which is why there are settlement areas around London and also on the eastern side and the south of England, hence Colchester. Um, that part of England has had very strong ties across the North Sea and across the Channel with what is now the Netherlands, the Low Countries, going back into medieval periods. So the, as one thing actually, that's a very interesting point, we didn't look at the transfer of 
architectural styles. But yes, you are absolutely right. The idea of bringing back architectural styles um, from your travels and of drawing particular architectural styles to your needs in your new community is something which we have very clear evidence in the built environment in Britain. So yes, there is a lot of low country interaction of people um, and of goods and communities. I mean, it's still an area where there are a lot of active ports going to those areas of Europe, because of course you've got Harwich, um, one of the main ports going across to the Dutch and the Belgian ports. So yes, it, it's, it's a connection that's been there for thousands of years um, and which continues to this day. Um, so I think that's all the questions. So next week is the very last one of this series. It is the special one. Did you want to say anything about it, Catherine? Or you... Oh, yes. Now, this was the one that we put up as a learner's choice. And um, so we have since before Christmas been collecting ideas from learners who've been emailing <clears throat> us with things that they would like to hear about for the last talk in this series. Uh, and the most popular suggestion was Anglo-Saxons. And so what I have decided to do is we're going to do a look at the Anglo-Saxon period, which encompasses early Anglo-Saxons and late Anglo-Saxons. It's a very long period in British history and one where there are, there are quite a few changes. The Anglo-Saxons move from being invaders in the early period after the fall of Roman Britain to being people who are invaded themselves. So we might even meet Emma of Normandy again when William the Conqueror arrives. And we're just gonna pick up on some objects we have in the British Museum collection, which have an Anglo-Saxon provenance, uh, many of which are Anglo-Saxon and British. And we're just gonna start teasing out some of the key themes and elements of Anglo-Saxon history in Britain after Roman Britain and before the introduction and then development of Norman Britain after the conquest. Sounds fantastic. Thank you very much, Catherine. We'll see you next week. You are most welcome. Have a lovely week, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>